The history of the Bahamas is one that has been deeply shaped by its location. Despite being the first territory claimed by the Spanish in the Americas, it ended up as a British colony and even a thriving republic of pirates that would eventually become a tourist paradise. To find out why, join me in this brief look at the history and politics of the Bahamas. The first inhabitants of the Bahamas were Tainos, an indigenous group thought to have originated in South America, who then began expanding across the Caribbean and probably arrived in the Bahamas from Cuba. Their branch in the islands was known as Lucayans, and like their brethren elsewhere in the region, spoke the Arawakan language, lived in touched circular huts known as Cane, ate corn and cassava, and traded with other islanders in long dugout canoes made from savas. They also used cotton and tobacco. Historians estimate that they may have arrived in the Bahamas between 300 and 400 AD, but their existence was severely disrupted with the arrival of Christopher Columbus in October 1492. As it happens, it was the Lucayans of Guanahani, an island that Columbus called San Salvador, the first native people of the Americas the Spanish encountered. Which modern specific island this is remains in dispute. The most accepted one is Watlings Island, renamed San Salvador in 1925, but there are other candidates. The origin of the Bahamas name itself is also in dispute. Some historians believe it is of Arawak origin, while others argue that Columbus came up with it when he described the archipelago as Bajamar, or shallow sea islands. A big reason for the historical uncertainty is that although Columbus officially took possession of the islands in the Bahamas for the Spanish king, the Europeans made no efforts to create settlements since they found little gold in the archipelago. Instead, they concentrated on the bigger islands in the Caribbean, especially Cuba and Hispaniola, and ignored the Bahamas except as a slave raiding destination. Over the next 30 years, nearly the entire native population was wiped out, either perishing from disease or enslaved and transported to other islands. By 1520, when the Spanish decided to remove those that remained, they found only 11 people. Despite controlling all nearby land, Florida, Cuba, and Hispaniola, given the archipelago's lack of resources of interest and no population remaining, the Spanish effectively abandoned the Bahamas, and thus the islands would remain unpopulated for the next 150 years, except for a Portuguese whaling station and what may have been an attempt at a French settlement in Abaco. In the 17th century, however, as Spanish might waned, and British and French supremacy increased, the archipelago would be in constant dispute between the rival powers. In 1629, the British laid claim to South Carolina and the Bahamas, but still made no efforts at settlement. This would not occur until 1648, when 70 prospective settlers, all English Puritans under the leadership of William Sale, a former governor of Bermuda, arrived from that colony in search of economic opportunities and religious freedom. They concentrated their efforts in an island they called the Luthera, freedom in Greek, but their hope was severely tested. The colony struggled with food shortages, poor soil, and conflict with the Spanish, which in turn led to infighting amongst the colonists. Despite the arrival of new settlers, including enslaved Africans, as well as help from Virginia and Massachusetts, many ended up returning to Bermuda, including William Sale. In fact, probably the most important thing that survived from this period was not in the Bahamas, because the funds that the Eleutherians repaid the big colony aid with went to the expansion of Harvard of all places, which stands to this day. It would take until 1666 for a fresh colony to be attempted, this time in New Providence Island by a new group of Bermudans. Baptized Charlestown in honor of the king, it would be renamed Nassau in 1695 in honor of William III's royal house. This one proved much more successful, largely because unlike Eleuthera, which was mostly based around farming, the people of New Providence made their living from the sea, fishing, hunting turtles and whales, and making salt. The most successful activity by far, however, was wrecking. That is, taking valuables from shipwrecks, which occurred quite often given the geography of the area, the frequency of major storms, and the fact that the Bahamas was close to the major sailing routes between Europe and the Caribbean. In 1670, the Crown attempted to formalize the new colony's status by granting a concession to the islands to the Duke of Albemarle and five Lord Proprietors of South Carolina, who in turn dispatched John Wentworth as the first governor. The new authorities immediately set out to create a parliamentary system and regulations that might curb piracy, which had expanded from wrecking, but which created constant conflict with the Spanish and the French. The locals weren't too keen on giving it up, however, even after Charles II himself intervened, since this had become the most profitable activity in the economy. A new governor, Robert Clark, even issued privateering permits that he argued helped secure the islands for the British. 
Instead, the Spanish retaliated and in 1684 not only burned down most of the colony, but placed the governor in chains and executed him. Still, this would not be the end of either piracy or the destruction of settlements. In fact, the Bahamas would soon enter a period popularly known as the Republic of Pirates. Traditionally dated from 1706 to 1718, the process really got going in 1696 when yet another governor, Nicholas Trott, was bribed by privateer Henry Every so that he could unload his cargo at Nassau Harbor, inspiring others to follow and making the port an important pirate base despite notional British control. The Spanish and French definitely didn't like this and yet again destroyed Nassau. Twice in fact, once in 1703 and another in 1706, but this only shifted control entirely to the pirates. That's because without even a weak government to deal with and still protected by the geographic advantages of the Bahamian archipelago, the buccaneers took over the Bahamas entirely. Ruled by an informal code where they chose their own governors, the period was dominated by two competing pirates, Benjamin Hornigold and Henry Jennings, who despite the rivalry managed to create an impressive outfit that soon began plundering the Caribbean, including British ships. Known as the Flying Gang, it was comprised of the most famous pirates at the time, including Charles Vane, Blackbeard, Calico Jack, Street Bonnet, Sam Bellamy, etc. The Bermuda governor estimated that as many as 1,000 pirates resided in the archipelago. It was a golden age of piracy, but it would not last. The beginning of the end came in 1717 when King George appointed a new governor, Woods Rogers, and granted a blanket pardon to any buccaneer who surrendered to British authority within a year. Many took up the deal, including Henry Jennings and Benjamin Hornigold. Others, like Blackbeard, ended up sailing for more promising sites, but was eventually killed in North Carolina by American forces in 1718. Others, like Calico Jack, relapsed and would also be eventually executed in Jamaica in 1720. And still others refused. When Rogers arrived with a disciplined set of troops, some of the more unrepentant ones were hanged, but it would take a while longer to get rid of the most prominent pirate, Charles Vane. He still managed a few raids, but in 1719, a major storm led to his shipwreck in an uninhabited island. He was eventually discovered by a passing British ship and executed in Port Royal in 1721. In the meantime, although the Bahamas had adopted the motto Expulsis Piratis Restituta Comercia, that is, pirates repulsed, commerce restored, conflict between the Spanish and the British continued as a war over disputes in Europe broke out in 1718. Known as the War of the Quadruple Alliance, it lasted until 1720 and brought with it yet another attack on Nassau that year. This time, however, it would be repelled by the local militia. For the next half a century, the British took advantage of the relative peace to solidify their authority, expand Nassau, and strengthen the city's defenses. Surprisingly, the next attack would come not from a rival imperial power, but from one of their challengers, the Americans. In 1776, aiming to seize materiel for the American Revolution War effort, the rebels sent a fleet of eight vessels under the leadership of Isaac Hopkins and quickly took over Nassau. Munitions, however, had already been sent to Boston, so the Americans left soon after with a hundred guns and the governor, Montford Brown, as hostage. This would not be the last time an enemy force would capture the city during the American Revolution, however. In 1782, the Spanish, allied with the American rebels, sent a 5,000 strong force from Cuba and managed to occupy the city for nearly two years. They would eventually be kicked out by a volunteer loyalist force from Florida under the command of Andrew Duvaux. It would be the last action of the war. So late, in fact, that it came after the Spanish had already agreed to give the Bahamas back to the English under the conditions of the Treaty of Paris. But of course, neither the Loyalists nor the Spanish defenders knew it at the time. After the war, Southern Loyalists, including free blacks, opted to relocate to warmer climates. The British government parceled out some land and Sir Guy Carleton, the commander of British forces, arranged for transportation and six months of supplies for the resettlement. The newcomers increased the overall Bahamian population sevenfold and boosted in particular the numbers of previously sparsely settled islands, including Abaco, Andros, Cat Island, Exuma, and so on. The population would grow even larger in the 1820s when the Spanish ceded Florida to the U.S. and some black Seminoles fled to the islands instead of fighting the encroaching Americans. Some of the new settlers brought enslaved black people and grew cotton for a while, but the island's pests and poor soil made cotton monoculture impossible. Revolts of the enslaved were also a constant threat. The largest one was in 1831 at Golden Grove in Cat Island. 
It lasted three days but was eventually put down and its leaders executed. When slavery was finally abolished in the British Empire in 1838, it dealt the final blow to the plantation system. By that time, the black population of the island was already considerable, making up three quarters of the total. Today, it's even higher, hovering around 90%. The following decades were ones of constant struggle, but the American Civil War opened up new opportunities. Blockade running. Britain's textile industry depended on southern cotton, but Union forces blockaded British ships from reaching southern ports. So blockade runners from Charleston met British ships in the Bahamas and traded cotton for British goods. Upon their return, they sold their shipment for huge profits. It was nice while it lasted, but it was all too short for the prosperity of the island. The rest of the 19th century and early 20th was spent trying to find a sustainable economic model. There were several failed attempts, including shipbuilding, the cultivation of citrus, pineapples, tomatoes, and sisal, the exporting of sponges, and later lumber. Unfortunately for the islands, none of them ended up being viable. Pineapples and citrus lasted the longest, but competition from Cuba, Florida, and California was too much and killed it. Sisal, a type of flowering agave plant native to Mexico, used mainly for ropes, could grow well in the islands and could well have become a sustainable economic engine, but it died when synthetic ropes appeared. Sponges did not become obsolete, but they did suffer competition from Cuba, and a blight that destroyed some local sponge beds killed the industry. Things were so bad that at one point, one in five Bahamians left the archipelago. Prohibition offered new opportunities. In 1919, the U.S. banned the manufacture, transport, or sale of alcohol, which meant that the smuggling of West Indian rum, Scotch whiskey, and English gin to the Bahamas was big business and enough to maintain the economy afloat. But it ended as suddenly as it had come, and the islands continued to struggle. By the time the Duke of Windsor, former King Edward VII, was installed as governor of the Bahamas in 1940, a position he got because he had chosen to abdicate the throne in order to marry Wallace Simpson, a divorcee, there was widespread poverty, few well-paying jobs, and plenty of economic malaise. The Duke called it a, quote, third-class British colony, and left as soon as he could, that is, as soon as the Second World War was over, although not before he undertook major renovations to the government house in Nassau. It would only be in the 1950s that the archipelago found a more sustainable economic model, tourism. Tourism had begun at the turn of the century as South Floridians found it easier to shop with the outer islands in the Bahamas. The closest one is less than 100 miles from the Florida coast after all. But with the arrival of Henry Flagler's railroad, which connected the eastern Florida coastline with the rest of the country, tourism was much diminished. It would not be until the 1950s with the expansion of jet travel the construction of the Nassau International Airport, and especially the tourism restrictions on American travelers to Cuba, that the Bahamas became a major destination transforming the social and economic structure of the islands. Today, it accounts for half of the island's GDP. The other important economic sector that developed around this period was offshore banking. It started mostly because American regulation made it unattractive for Americans to buy non-American securities and for non-Americans to invest in American bonds. The fact that the Bahamas was also a low-tax location on the same time zone as New York and that it was too expensive to create branches in London cemented the country as a preferred location for the banking sector. Today, it accounts for nearly one-third of GDP and the Bahamian currency is pegged to the dollar. Political change would also arrive in the 20th century. The islands had had a significant amount of autonomy since the 18th century, but its changing fortunes and global events made people rethink its colonial status. First, the Canadians made a serious attempt to incorporate it as a Canadian province in the early 20th century. This met with some support in the islands, although not everyone was equally enthusiastic, but London vetoed the proposal. Later, in the late 1950s, the British and several Caribbean leaders attempted to create a West Indies Federation that would incorporate all British Caribbean colonies into it, but the Bahamian leadership opted not to join because they thought a better model was in associating themselves with North America rather than other British colonies. Thus, the British government opted to make some constitutional changes in the 1960s, which eventually paved the way for complete independence on July 10, 1973. Since then, the country has been ruled by two main political parties. The Progressive Liberal Party, or PLP, controls the government currently, and is on the left or center-left, and the Free National Movement, or FNM, on the right or center-right. The oldest of the two is the PLP. Founded in 1953, it wanted a larger voice for the Afro-Bahamian population and originated as the opposition to the dominant group at the time, the white oligarchy known as the Bay Street Boys. This group, 
and British descended politicians responded with the creation of their own party, the United Bahamian Party, an organization led by Roland Theodore Simonet, a rich man whose fortune had begun with alcohol smuggling. The UBP went on to control the government for over a decade, especially because there was some gerrymandering that favored it, but as independence grew nearer, their fortunes turned, and eventually the organization would cease to exist. The Progressive Liberal Party, under the leadership of Lyndon Pindling, a London-educated lawyer that is considered father of the nation, then went on to dominate Bahamian politics for over 20 years, winning an impressive five general elections in a row, three if one only counts those after independence. But not everyone was happy with the Prime Minister's leadership. In 1971, eight dissident members broke away from the PLP and joined the remnants of the old United Bahamian Party to create the Free National Movement. And while they had to wait decades to gain power, they finally did in 1992, when Hubert Ingram, another former PLP member, won eight more seats in the necessary 25 to achieve a majority. Since then, the FNM has won four out of seven elections, including Ingram winning three of those. The current Prime Minister is Philip Davis, a lawyer from Cat Island, who won in a landslide in September 2021. As of February 2022, he remains broadly popular with an impressive 67% approval rating, despite facing a stiff test dealing with the COVID pandemic, both its spread and the loss of tourism. In the meantime, beyond economic issues, the country faces two other major challenges. The first is hurricanes. Storms have long shaped life in the archipelago, but as population and development rises, they become far more costly. Up until recently, the deadliest recorded hurricane had been the 1932 storm, a Category 5 hurricane that pummeled the islands, especially around the Abaco area, and killed at least 16 people. In 2019, however, Hurricane Dorian surpassed all of that. It also made landfall as a Category 5, but killed at least 74 people, and its damage was estimated at around $3.4 billion. An estimated 45% of houses in the Abaco Islands and Grand Bahama suffered severe damage or were completely destroyed. As hurricanes continue to multiply in the Atlantic, the country's resiliency will be severely tested. The other big issue is crime. The Bahamas has long been used as a base to smuggle drugs into the U.S., perhaps most famously from Norman's Key, where Carlos Leder, one of the co-founders of the Medellin cartel, created an airstrip that served as a transshipment point for the smuggling of cocaine. The property was eventually confiscated by the Bahamian government in 1987. Today, several drug organizations continue to use the Bahamian route, but local gangs have also proliferated, and as they fight for turf, violent crime has grown alarmingly. Keeping them in check will not be easy, especially as they respond to developments in the United States, something the Bahamian government has no control over. And so, Bahamian history rolls on, forever shaped by its location.